We are very pleased to have Ray McGovern with us today. Ray spoke with us a couple of months ago. Ray McGovern is a native of the Bronx, New York, and he now lives in North Carolina. In the early 60s, Ray was an Army Infantry Intelligence Officer. He then served as a CIA, CIA analyst for 27 years, from the administration of John F. Kennedy to that of George H.W. Bush. Ray's duties included chairing national intelligence estimates and preparing the president's daily brief, which he briefed one-on-one -on -one to President Ronald Reagan's five most senior national security advisors from 1981 to 1985. Ray is an expert on Russia, and he speaks fluent Russian. He's a prolific writer who's not afraid to speak truth to power, even in person when he gets the chance. Ray is often interviewed by national and international media, though rarely in the mainstream U.S. media who cannot stand to hear narratives critical of U.S. foreign policy and war making. You can find Ray's articles and interviews at his website, raymcgovern.com. In January 2003, Ray co-created Veterans Intelligence Professionals for Sanity to expose how intelligence was being falsified to justify war on Iraq. Veterans Intelligence Professionals for Sanity has attracted a number of former U.S. intelligence and diplomatic veterans. Recently, they sent an important memo to President Biden warning him about the danger of escalating the Ukraine war and the very real possibility of nuclear war, which is the subject of Ray McGovern's presentation today. Veterans for Peace is proud to count Ray McGovern as a much valued member. Please welcome Ray McGovern. Thank you, Jerry. What I try to do is uh, select some material that I haven't shown or spoken before. That's kind of an easy thing to do with the events of the last several days, as a matter of fact, on the nuclear threat front. But I think just to give people a, a kind of a different perspective on what it was like back in the 90s when, uh, when Bill Clinton and his wisdom decided to renege on the promise not to move NATO countries one inch, that was the promise, one inch east of East Germany at the time. Uh, I wanna show you a, a clip of uh, Senator uh, Bill Bradley. Now, he was a pretty progressive guy. He studied at Oxford when Bill Clinton was there. They were sort of friends, I guess, but uh, Bill Bradley did more homework than Bill Clinton. He knew Russia up up, up and down. And uh, when he heard that there was a uh, there was a real possibility, despite all the warnings of people from George Kennan to Brzezinski, for God's sake, uh, despite all those warnings that uh, Bush, Cheney, Condoleezza Rice, were about to try to get Ukraine and Georgia into NATO. Uh, just before, this was late January, actually, where he went, went before some friends at the Carnegie Institute and sort of let us let it all hang out. And what I thought is to let you see this, to give you some idea of how one responsible politician who knew what the stakes were, how he reacted to this news. This is a terribly sad uh, thing for me because I spent a lot of time in the 80s and early 90s on Russia. I'd go there every year, I'd spend weeks there, I traveled all over. I got to know most of the people who ran the government and who are now there. And um, I think that <clears throat> right now we're confronted with something that potentially could have been avoided. And the fundamental blunder that the United States made in um, the uh, mid 80s, late, late 80s, early 90s, was the expansion of NATO. I mean, uh, here we'd won the Cold War. We'd won the Cold War. And <clears throat> you um, then had people saying, well, now what are we going to do with NATO? Oh, well, I don't know. It's a bureaucracy. It works. What are we going to do with it? And so then the idea of expanding NATO. And the problem with it is, the, is this. During the negotiation for the reunification of Germany, Gorbachev and Jim Baker, Jim Baker says to Gorbachev, 
you know, in the treaty it says, you know, no NATO troops in what was then East Germany. In the discussions, and I had this conversation with Gorbachev last summer, he told me very directly, the conversation with Jim Baker, the question was, Baker saying, NATO, if you agree to reunification of Germany in NATO, uh, no expand, NATO will not expand one inch further east, which is what I went to see Gorbachev to confirm, because I care so much about this. Is this true? Now, the interpretation on the American side, Scowcroft says, well, he misinterpreted. Baker, I haven't have quite pinned down. But Gorbachev says very specifically, he said, if you expand one inch further, if you allow reunification, Germany and NATO, NATO will not expand one inch further east. And then Gorbachev told me, Kohl told him the same thing, which was new information, right? So the first Bush keeps his promise. You assume it's a promise. They talk about partnership for peace, and, you know, Russians kind of like that idea. And then Clinton comes in. What's the early thing he does in his first term? He expands NATO. Why expand NATO? And I read, the, and I've been rereading, because I've been thinking of writing something about this, Strobe Talbot's article in Foreign Affairs about why expand NATO, and you read it and you say, huh, that's a reason? You know? And last summer again, I'm talking to a number of people that I've known for many years, two guys who ran for president in Russia in 1996 and 2000. And um, you know, one of them says to me, I'm out campaigning in the Urals. Somebody comes up to me and says, this is 96. Why, why are the Americans expanding NATO? Isn't that a military alliance? And they said, well, yeah, but it's, it's a military alliance. And the guy said, the politician said, Russians might not be able to understand puts and calls, but they certainly understand tanks, right? And think of it this way. What would any politics 101, somebody who's a friend, supporter, goes bankrupt? What do you do? You call them up on the phone and say, you know, Joe, it's tough. I know you, things are going to be okay. You're going to be back. You know, you show them some respect. And what did we do? We kicked them when they were down. We expanded NATO. And in expanding NATO, created the issue that allows the authoritarianism that has returned to say it was justified. And I think that it was a blunder of monumental proportions. When I was at Oxford, I spent a lot of time on the origins of the Cold War. And you know, I read all these documents, and I mean, the, all of the documents. And it's, uh, you know, the Russians were responsible, basically. You know, here, it's uh, unfortunate. It's a blunder of vision. And in the best of circumstances, it was bureaucratic inertia in NATO that people had to have a job. In the worst of circumstances, it was a self-fulfilling prophecy with certain people in the Clinton administration who, who were irredentist, East European uh, uh, types who believe Russia will forever be the enemy and therefore we got to protect against the time where they might once again be aggressive, thereby creating a self-fulfilling prophecy. So. What do you do with it now? Still have a, still talk. But if we had done that, and if we'd really done a strategic partnership, talking about common threats over the long term and what we can do together, because we knew ultimately Russia would be back. I mean, they did have oil even then. Uh, you know, imagine how Iran would be different today. Imagine how Central Asia would be different. You know, so. You've got me at a kind of moment where my feelings about the Russian thing are extremely sad because I, I think that we've created a problem that could have been easily avoided. And we, we've lost a partner that could have been enormously important over the long term. And in particular, you know, with regard to the issues that most threaten us today. Uh, what Bill Bradley is saying is indeed sad. Uh, he describes it as a fundamental 
error. Um, and you know, he didn't have to he didn't have to cite Gorbachev. He could have mentioned Ambassador Jack Matlock, who was there, who was always there, and testified to what uh, what this very smart lawyer from Texas, uh, Baker, the way he the way he wangled us. What he said, according to Jack, was uh, look, we need, uh, we'd like to see, given the bedlam in Eastern Europe, but we'd like to see, uh, yeah, a reunited Germany. <laughs> no. Okay, folks. Those of you who, of a certain age may react the same way I did at the time. My God, no, 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 no. Re -react. My God, maybe, it, maybe I just saw too many uh, it's too many war films as a, as a child. I, I went through the whole war s still alive. Uh, no one wanted a reunited Germany. I mean, that's why NATO was created, to keep the U.S. in, to keep the Russians out, and to keep Germany divided. Okay? Okay. So, uh, long story short, uh, now, McGovern spent the war years as a boy, and he didn't get shot at, and none of his family got killed. Not so with Gorbachev, with Shevardnadze, the foreign minister, or now with Putin. They know what war is like, okay? So imagine Jim Baker saying, well, how would it be, you know, if we had a Reunited Germany. <laughs> well, uh, wow, reunited Germany. Uh, they had to think about that, but they came back and they said, what's the quo for this awful quid? And the pro, of course, was as Jim says, well, how about, uh, so how, how would it be if we promised, of course, our hearts and hope to die, that we wouldn't move NATO one inch toward you guys. It wouldn't one inch eastward. Well, they bought it and they made a big mistake because they did not get it written down, okay? Now my father's a lawyer, right? And he says, Ray, for God's sake, always get it written down. Got a truff and a shepherd Nazi, but for whatever reason, didn't. And so the promise was broken by Bill Clinton in the first instance. And what I'd like to do is fast forward now uh, from Bill Clinton all the way to 2000, well, yeah, 2008, let's do that. We saw Bill Bradley talk about all this in late January, 2008. Now, these dates are important, so I'd ask you to remember. On the 1st of February, 2008, uh, our ambassador in Moscow, his name is William Burns. Actually, he's now CIA director. Anyhow, he gets this call. Uh, the foreign minister wants to see you right away. <laughs> so goes in and Sergei Lavrov, uh, still the foreign minister, but recently appointed back in 2008. The date was February 1st. So about 10 days after Bill Bradley made that little, made that little complaint. So Lavrov says, Mr. Burns, do you know what net means? Burns said, well, yeah. Well, net means net, all right? And Bill Burns, to his credit, titles the cable that he sent back to Washington, as I indicate on this slide. Net means net, Russia's NATO enlargement, red lines. We hear a lot about red lines these days. That was back on the 1st of February, 2008, okay? Now, what did, uh, what did Burns report? He said, well, Lavrov gave me the riot act. He says, there's strong opposition in Moscow. So we got military strategic concerns, says Lavrov. And to his credit, Ambassador Burns said, you know, it's understandable that uh, Russia might have these military strategic concerns in their, their own backyard. That was, that was big. When the policy is clearly in the other direction, you usually don't have an ambassador owning up and saying, hey, these are legitimate concerns. Bill Burns did. That gives me hope that there may be one sane 
person in the room these days in Washington when they make these decisions. What Lavrov went into saying was that, you know, civil war is likely, the, the country's going to fall apart. It's a manufactured to, it's going to be divided. And then we will be, quote, we'll be forced to decide whether to intervene. February 1st, 2008. He added, that is, Burns added in his cable, you know, it's not like it was when Russia fell apart. Putin has built his military and he's feeling his oats in a new way. So Russia now feels itself able to respond more forcefully to actions contrary to its national interests. Whoa, NATO enlargement contrary to Russia's national interest? Again, Burns is telling it like it is. <clears throat> now, how does McGovern know all this? Thanks to Chelsea Manning, and to WikiLeaks, they published the cable. Is it an authentic Embassy of Moscow cable? <laughs> it sure as hell is. If I've seen one of them, I've seen about 3,500 of them in my career at CIA. So this was, this was where Burns was operated, was taken apart and said, look, don't do it, don't do it. February 1st, 2008, that's barely two months later, February, March, yeah, uh, April. Ukraine and Georgia are invited to be NATO members. So the people in charge prevailed over the vassals in NATO who had their qualms about all this way back then. And we had the summit the declaration saying, quote, NATO welcomes Ukraine's and Georgia's Euro-Atlantic aspirations for membership in NATO. We agreed today that these countries will become members of NATO, okay? The formal declaration. So we're thumbing our nose at Lavrov and Putin and all the Russians said, we're gonna do what we like. We're gonna have Ukraine and Georgia in NATO. That's 2008. Well, what does this have to do with, with uh, uh, facing down and confronting the Russians after their country fell apart and they, uh, yeah, they weren't up to anything. Well, there was an opportunity there to sell, to manufacture, to make and, and trade a whole bunch of arms, and people got very rich doing that. Eisenhower called this the MIC, the, the, MIC, the military industrial complex. I've coined this military industrial congressional intelligence media academia think tank complex. I say media. And we circle it in red because it's the linchpin. Without the media, which reports the rest of the Mickey Mouse, let's face it, which is owned by the rest of the Mickey Mouse. Without the media, you can't do these things. With the media, you can do all manner of crazy things. And that's what we're going to address later as to how crazy it can get. I'm proud to say that the late Stephen Cohen and Pepe Escobar, a good friend of mine, both endorsed this little acronym, and it's beginning to take a little bit, uh, beginning to catch on a little bit. Uh, in a word, the MIC, yeah, that was that was back 60 years ago. Now it's more. And just as an aside here, uh, Eisenhower himself warned that the only antidote, the only way you can prevent the military industrial complex from dominating all our lives and, rest, and, and uh, endangering our democracy is a well-informed populace, okay? Now, as you know, we don't have a well-informed populace now. That's where the media comes in. That's why we circle it in red. Okay, we'll fast forward now to what, just a couple of days ago. Uh, this is where it gets really sticky. Now, Averill Haynes is the National Intelligence Director, and she testified before the Senate Armed Services Committee uh, just on the 10th. So that was, what, three days ago. And, uh, you know, it was really sort of awkward because she's a very bright lady, right? Well, when she got into this uh, tricky subject, which is a little bit beyond her, and she is advisedly nervous about it. Now, this is what she said. 
there, there's not sort of, sort of uh, an imminent potential for Putin to use nuclear weapons unless he sees an existential threat. Now that could be the case. It could be the case that he sees an existential threat if he perceives he is losing the war in Ukraine. Wow. Now, if you made that into a little syllogism <clears throat> with a major premise, the first part, minor premise, the second, what would your conclusion be? <laughs> well, it would be at variance with US policy because as I note down at the bottom of the slide here, that policy is, now we don't want a World War III, uh, we don't want nuclear weapons being used, but we're gonna make Putin lose in Ukraine anyway. So try to parse all that. These intelligence people, including Bill Burns, who talked about uh, Putin uh, feeling that this is, this is something he can't lose. And Haynes saying, uh, Putin feels this is an existential threat. An existential threat. What's that mean? Well, the US faced an existential threat. And maybe only Ken Mayers and I were alive uh, or in uniform at the time. Uh, but I reported to Fort Benning on the 3rd of November, 1962, and there were no weapons there to train with. <laughs> yeah, right. The infantry, the army infantry at the, uh, school uh, had no weapons. Where were they? Well, we found out from some sergeant, they were all down in Key West. Now, how far is Key West from Cuba? Not very far. That's how close we were, okay? Now, why, was, why do I mention that? Well, because John Kennedy, to his credit, saw that as an existential threat. He had some really good advisors and some really bad ones. <laughs> the bad ones wanted to nuke Russia and China, by the way, and do it all in one fell swoop. And when they were asked, well, how many Americans would do it perish? And they said, well, only about 20 million or maybe 30 million or so. So that's the point. That's when Kennedy said, these guys are crazy. What John Kennedy insisted was that Llewellyn Thompson, ambassador par excellence to the, to the Soviet Union at the time, that he had just left his post <clears throat> and he insisted that Llewellyn Thompson be part of all the discussions regarding how they reacted to Khrushchev's various proposals. Thompson helped figure out how you answer one conciliatory message, how you disregard uh, the, the non-conciliatory message that was sent with the military looking over Khrushchev's shoulder. And we got out of that with some sensible bargaining. We gave the Russians a quo for their quid. We took uh, missiles out of Turkey. But that was an existential threat, why? Well, because those missiles could have destroyed our naval bases in Norfolk and they could have wreaked havoc. They could have been a sort of Damocles at very least over John Kennedy's head. So that was big. Now, we escaped that one and we escaped it just by the, uh, not by much. Uh, there's one true story about a naval, uh, about a submarine. Uh, that was uh, really out of communication and thought the Russians had lost the war. There was nothing to lose. So it was going to surface and sh shoot it off its nuclear torpedoes and kill as many uh, U.S. ships as they, as they could. This is right outside of Cuba. And guess what? They had one political officer. Say what you know, say what you will about uh, Communist Party political officers, but he put the kibosh on these on this command and said, no, without instructions from Moscow, we're not going to do this. They surfaced and found out the war was over. They didn't need to start it. OK, that was big. Now, to compare the situation now with Biden and what I call the sophomores that, uh, that are around, weren't even, well, I think uh, Sullivan must have been in diapers when uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, took place. 
They don't know. They don't know from nothing, as we would say in the Bronx. And that's the kind of advice that Biden's getting. So uh, when the top intelligence officials say, well, you know, yeah, uh, we don't think, uh, they usually say we assess, but April Haynes is a lawyer. So she says, we perceive that uh, Putin probably won't resort to nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, unless she, unless he faces an existential threat. Remember what Lavrov told Ambassador Burns about the existential, existential threat that Russia faced if Ukraine became part of NATO? So April Haynes is saying, well, we don't think that, that Putin's going to do this unless he, he, he uh, faces this uh, existential threat of losing it interpret that losing in Ukraine. He, so, so bottom, the conclusion of this syllogism should have been, well, we need to do something to work this thing, stuff out without driving Putin in a, into a corner where we, he will face this existential threat. And then he might consider using nuclear weapons. Now, I don't think we're anywhere near that now, but you could see the, the nonchalance, the, uh, you know, Oh, oh, there's one other thing that uh, April Haynes said. And she said, you know, if, if Putin decides that he's under this kind of threat, uh, we'll, get, we'll, we'll get signals uh, before he, he does anything. I'm saying, huh? <laughs> so, so we expect Putin to send some signal. Oh, hey, I'm going to send a little, little nuclear weapon into the middle of Finland if the, the Finns do what they seem to be uh, high bound to do well i don't think so and that kind of reflects uh, a lack of experience and intelligence haynes is a smart lady but she's very very green when it comes to intelligence the other thing is this intelligence officers are not supposed to go beyond what those two sentences say okay that sets up what we think putin cares about what he might do it's not appropriate for intelligence officers to say, therefore, our policy should be, okay? So that, this, that's where the policymakers come in and uh, they don't need to listen to intelligence. It has become quite the vogue not to listen to intelligence. And uh, that's, that's where we are. Uh, I will say this one other thing, and that is that uh, Avril Haynes did trans... Well, she, she went over the line in talking about negotiations. What do I mean? Well, she said, well, you know, Russia is not going to stop this offensive in southeast Ukraine, and we're gonna, not going to stop giving weapons to, to, to the Ukrainians. And so there's no real point. There's no prospect of having negotiations anytime soon. Well, Ms. Haynes, um, you know, that's not your part, okay? You can talk about the situation in Ukraine, but it's a policy decision as to whether negotiations are a smarter thing to do than what you are hinting at here. Namely, Putin with his back against the wall might even consider use of nuclear weapons. That's how serious it is, okay? Now, the negotiations should take place. There's no reason at all. And who's the fly in the ointment? It's demonstrably true that the U.S., whether it uses Boris Johnson, of all people, to tell the Ukrainians, no, 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 no. We don't want any agreement. Don't talk to the Russians anymore in Turkey. Whether it takes Boris Johnson as an acolyte for Washington to do that, it's done. And Zelensky, I, you know, I pity him, great, great pressure from the United States and from the, the likes of Boris Johnson, but also considerable pressure from the hard right, appropriately called neo-Nazis, who are not going to stand for any accommodation with the Russians. So what we see now is, is a kind of a policy that's working itself out uh, under under what most of my reliable military friends say, is the likelihood of uh, Russian advances in Donbass, Russian capture of 
Donbass. And Russia uh, kind of enveloping uh, most of the Ukrainian forces and rendering them harmless. Uh, how far the Russians will go uh, beyond uh, Crimea is an open question, but certainly they would like to uh, extend uh, their, uh, their holdings past Odessa. So we're in a situation now where uh, people would blithely saying, well, uh, you know, it could be, it could be uh, nuclear if uh, Putin feels like it. And the, the important thing to do, I think, here is to think, think about how Putin looks at all this. Now, uh, John Mearsheimer, who is my favorite uh, School of Realism professor, talks, that, uh, talks about it uh, being an existential threat to Putin, our and NATO's involvement in uh, Ukraine. But he also says, you know, it's also regarded or can be regarded as an existential threat to the Democratic Party, which is facing a real tough slog in the elections coming up in November. Be mindful of the fact that Vladimir Putin has made it very, very clear that he realizes and regrets and doesn't think it will ever change anytime soon, regrets the fact, the existence of the fact that US foreign policy is pretty much a creature, is pretty much in his word, hostage to domestic political considerations. And Putin has had lots of experience in that. I'll just cite one and has to do with the ceasefire negotiated in Syria <clears throat> back when John Kerry and Sergei Lavrov really put their backs into it, negotiated for what was it, 11 months, <laughs> 11 months, and finally got a ceasefire arrangement in Syria, which was broken by the US Air Force eight days later when they bombed the hell at fixed Syrian positions that had been there for months. Putin complained loudly about that at Valdai and elsewhere. He said, you know, this was an agreement that was personally approved by me and by President Obama. Apparently, when Obama and Kerry get back into their little coterie of friends, uh, they don't remember what they promised. What I'm saying here is that you have not only the example of James Baker making a promise, you have Obama as recently as much later making a promise. And now I think the, the, the fly is in the ointment. What I mean is, and, and I'll, I'll spell this out because I'm still intrigued by it. Uh, you recall the various symmetry that, that took place, place late last year. Well, if memory serves, uh, Biden and Putin talked on the 7th of December, and they agreed to set up this negotiating process uh, real quick, just like the Russians advised or demanded, if you will, uh, that in the next month, in January. And then all of a sudden, Putin says, Mr. Biden, we have to talk again. It's the 30th of December, hmm. 30th of December last year. And what comes out of that? Why did Putin really need to talk to Joe Biden? Well, the Russian readout says that Biden promised not to put offensive strike missiles in Ukraine. There was no dispute about that. Now, is this a sore issue? Is this an issue for the Russians? Well, you just listen to the things that I've said before or things on various tapes where Putin makes very clear that he considers an existential threat the use of bases in Romania, already in place in Romania, going into Poland that are ostensibly ABM sites but can be changed by sticking a, a disk in the computer into firing off what, what Putin calls Tomagok missiles, Tomagok, okay, Tomahawk missiles, or hypersonic missiles eventually. So what 
Putin, in my view, and this is speculation, wanted to know from Biden with two things. Number one, will you, will you personally supervise what happens now in these negotiations? Putin got that. Biden promised that. The second thing was, hey, uh, you know, this, these negotiations get off a really stupid start. If you promised not to put offensive strike missiles of the kind we fear are going into Poland and Romania in Ukraine. Now, the Russian official readout says that's what Joe Biden promised. Any, anybody, anybody hear that? Anybody see that in US media? Again, my speculation is that as soon as uh, Joe Biden uh, worked, woke up the next day, his advisor said, hey, Joe, come on. <laughs> you can't promise things like that. Forget about it. And that got back to uh, back to the Russians. Now, I don't know that for, for a fact, but isn't it queer? Isn't it strange that nobody objected to the, the Russian readout of this conversation, that the Russians were very insistent that it take place before the negotiations, and that if I'm right, the Russians had yet another reason to distrust what the president of the United States says and the power he has to force decisions. I think most of you know what Wag the Dog is. Uh, think only back to uh, Bill Clinton's dalliance with what was it, Monica Lewinsky and, and the people in Sudan had to suffer uh, uh, their pharmaceutical in industry decimated by, by Tomogok missiles. Uh, but here, here's, the, here's the deal, folks. Putin knows these things, okay? You know, it really is helpful to put your, yourself in how Putin's frame of mind might be. Now, does he know that Joe Biden was a charter member of the coup plotters on, uh, in Kiev on 22nd February, 2014? Yeah, he does. How does he know that? <laughs> well, those of you who have listened to the intercepted conversation that was on YouTube before the coup, know that he was going to be brought in as an international personage to seal, to, to make it stick, to glue this thing together in the words of Assistant Secretary of State Victoria Newland. Now she's number three at the State Department for, for achieving such wonderful deeds. Okay, so he knows that. I, I'd love to have been a, a fly on the wall to find out whether uh, Putin braced Biden with that at that summit on the 16th of June last year. Uh, I suppose he didn't, but uh, he could have. Now, the other thing is uh, Sun Hunter is really in, in big trouble now, isn't he? He, he? We all know about that cushy job he landed with his great expertise on, on uh, energy with the, that Ukrainian uh, corporation. And then, oh God, he, he lost his laptop. That's another story, isn't it? We know that the initial reports were true. We know that even more was true about daddy's involvement, getting a cut from these things. Most things were documentary. They were concealed before the election, but they're there. And they're coming up now. For some reason, the New York Times and the Washington Post have fessed up that they, they suppressed this. How did they suppress it? Do you remember? Leading intelligence officials, all 51 of them said, who did this? The Russians. The Russians infiltrated Hunter, Hunter Biden's laptop. Come on. Some Americans are willing to believe anything. Anyhow, uh, even those 51 intelligence, uh, intelligence hacks are completely wrong. And they would let themselves be used by the Democrats before the election. Now, what else is Biden a charter member of? Well, he's a charter member of Russiagate, which has been thoroughly discredited by now. You may not know that because the, the press has not kept up for this for some reason, but we know now that, for example, there was no Russian hack of the DNC emails. Nobody hacked, 
not Russia, not anybody. How do we know the head of the cyber firm who the FBI asked to look into it? They said there's no technical evidence of any hack. We know that. I know that. You don't know that because Adam Schiff kept that hidden for two and a half years, sworn congressional testimony by the head of CrowdStrike. And the New York Times has succeeded in keeping that deep sixth for more than two more years. So we've got two and, about four and a half years where we should have known that there was no Russian hack. And now we know. Worse still, from the president's point of view, is the fact that in court now are documents showing that um, the Democrats and the Hillary Clinton campaign manufactured all manner of charges that the Trump was in cahoots with the Russians. And one of them, one of the early ones before the election was Alpha Bank in Russia. There was a connection with the Trump people and Alpha Bank. Well, that turned out to be, and we have the emails that show it to be, uh, completely disingenuous, completely false. And, and some of the experts uh, advised the Democrats that this was false. They went ahead with it anyway. And one of the fancy lawyers that uh, working, was working for the Democrats there is going on trial on the 16th of this month, not too long from now. Watch it and see how much comes out. Now, why do I say all this stuff? Well, Putin is looking at all this stuff and saying, my God, you know, the Democrats are really in bad shape. They even have Republican support now for being really tough and tall on Ukraine. And, you know, um, if you look at President Biden, my opposite number, says Putin, I don't know, it doesn't look, so, it doesn't look like, well, I don't know how reliable he is or how much he's putty uh, in the hands of the blob that runs our foreign policy or Victoria Nuland, who he made number three Secretary of State. So suffice it to add that here is, uh, here is Putin looking on all this and say, my God, would wag the dog fill into this? I've already said that uh, US foreign policy is hostage to domestic political development. What does that mean for all the problems? All the problems that not only Biden, but the Democrats are in right now. What should I anticipate? What should I fear? I think I'll close there. Thanks very much for paying attention. How do you use the word Putin? Or should the word Putin be used in uh, discussing causes uh, and, and, and resolution of, of, of this war? As, as the, the, you understand what I'm talking about, I think. Yeah, I'd Thank be you. happy to respond. Good to Thank see you, you again, Nick. Good to see yeah. you. No, I think this is a very important question, OK? Um, if, as I believe to be the case, uh, Putin and his, his, his members there of the government in Russia look on Ukraine as a existential threat in the same way that Kennedy looked on the missiles in Cuba as an existential threat. And I will add just a small codicil there uh, we were very proud of having discovered the missiles. And uh, we told the Kennedy, there are the missiles, they're there. We don't think they're armed. We assess that they're not armed. Well, Kennedy looked at us and he said, okay, you assess that they're not armed? Guess what? They were armed. They were ready to fire. When did we learn that? Three decades later, okay? So the stakes were even higher than we thought they were. So when the intelligence community says, we assess or we think, well, that kind of you gotta take that with a grain of salt and you gotta talk to these people. Now, again, the analogy, Cuban Missile Crisis, what did the US do? They engaged Khrushchev. They worked all kinds of channels, including through Ambassador Thompson, who was always there at those meetings, okay? I've talked to his daughters. He was very proud of how Kennedy included him and let him say his piece against Curtis LeMay and all these crazy guys that wanted to 
set the world on fire. Okay. Now, here's the analogy. Here's here's Putin complaining, complaining for many years about these sites going into Poland and Romania, which, as I said before, you can put a little disc in there and change them from ABM sites against whom? Iran. Give me a break. They were never ABM sites against Iran for obvious reasons, okay? So you see Putin doubting all this and kind of trying to having a lot of bad experience with broken promises to include the president of the United States and wondering who the hell's in charge over there anyway? Is it Admiral Richards, head of SAC or STRATCOM or whatever it is? Because he says, oh, these mini looks are okay. So what I'm saying here is that in contrast to Cuba, there was no real negotiation here. The, the Russians insisted we negotiate very quickly at the turn of the year, and we did. And Biden promised Putin there will be no offensive strike missiles in Ukraine. We know that. Nobody disputes that. Have you seen that? Have you seen that, Nick? No. no. It's not been in the U.S. media. So, yeah, I don't think it's a stretch to say, well, you know, Putin got that promise extracted from Biden. And what happened? Boom! It never showed up in the negotiations that started barely 12 days later. OK, it was forgotten. So putting yourself in Putin's place. OK, uh, they're not going to negotiate in good faith. Uh, even the president makes promises that they don't follow up on. Uh, what am I going to do? Now, the way I can re reconstruct this is that Putin turned to the president of China, Xi. Now, they had been working together for many, many years, and Putin and Xi had this very cordial personal relationship, as well as what was tantamount, tantamount to a military alliance. Um, he and Z decide that Putin will go to the Beijing Olympics and help open the Olympics, which he does. Okay. That was February 4th. Okay. Now their their cooperation had become so close that I believe that Putin said to Z, hey, by the way, Z, uh, the Americans are not serious about negotiations. They're building up uh, to, to strike at our compatriots in Donetsk and Lugansk. I may have to in, invade Ukraine. As a matter of fact, I think we're going to have to invade Ukraine. Z. You mean after the Olympics, right? Oh, yeah, after the Olympics. That's what I'm now, that's not a ringing endorsement. <laughs> And China's principal foreign policy has always been no interference in the affairs of other countries. Okay, we're Westphalia purified. Well, as I said before, they made an exemption for Putin. Okay, now whether he told them that or not is really immaterial. What you saw following the invasion is full Chinese support. And I don't think that Putin would have gone into Ukraine without knowing that he had China. For instance, in the correlation of forces, you've got the white West and you've got the colored East. I mean, Russians, okay, they've been blackened so much by US media, they're, they're colored too, okay? Now that's big because we talk about a monopolar, you know, that's no more, okay? The US is not in control anymore, but it's not bipolar either, except in the psychiatric sense, okay? It's, it's, by, it's, it's, it's the West against all these people who either abstained or voted against what the, what the condemnation of Russia. And as recently as yesterday, that happened by a Chinese person on the Human Rights Council of the UN who said, look, this is one-sided stuff commentary. You ought to really have a more balanced approach. So the world is now divided in a new way that hasn't been divided in decades and decades. And uh, so what am I saying? I'm saying that uh, when you talk about Putin and you tell your friends, you know, some of my best friends <laughs> say, insist on saying, I detest Putin, I detest Putin. Well, that doesn't help. 
That's not what an intelligence officers do, for God's sake. You try to understand. And that's what happened in the Western press. You demonize them. I could never believe five years I stayed in Germany and since that the Germans had not been able to grow up in the 77 years since the, since the war and realize that they could think and act for themselves. My friends in Germany say, no, primary has always, priority has always, must be given to the alliance. We must be seen as loyal to the alliance. Well, I mean, that's going to come crashing down uh, sometime. I thought much sooner than now. But I think probably next couple of years, with all these sanctions hurting the Germans more than anybody else, I think it's going to come, come to a, what the Chinese used to call, it will come to a no good end. And I wonder if you might want to elaborate on that. Well, I think he already had to backtrack. You know, he wanted this written document, uh, the security uh, document that uh, would revise, uh, would disallow Ukraine becoming a NATO member and rearrange security arrangements in Europe. Well, he had to come off that, <laughs> as I suggested before, when, when the military said, yeah, right, right, Vladimir, this is really great. Vladimir, you get a piece of paper and what do they do? They rip it up as soon as a new president comes in. Come on, give us a break. So I think, I don't think that he faces much opposition internally, politically or domestically. His approval ratings are over 80%. Uh, most of the, uh, the polls of, Amer of Russian people Put him very high and also put relations with, uh, with what he's doing in Ukraine very high. Uh, it's a quite a, 80% is very different from what Joe Biden is enjoying these days. And again, I just point out this is not good news because Joe Biden may, may be prompted to do something really stupid just because the midterms are coming up and that's there's a history to doing that kind of thing. And I don't care. You know, nobody cares what McGovern thinks. But what does Putin think about this? I think he's very much on his guard. I don't think he has to worry about his his companions. He seems to be really well respected by everyone. Uh, his people seem to be behind him, except for the thousands we read about in the New York Times. And uh, I think that uh, what we're going to see in the next couple of weeks, if my if Scott Ritter and others are correct in and advising me this way, that uh, the Russian military will succeed in the in the Donbas and also in southern uh, in, in uh, Nikolaev, also in uh, what's in Mariupol. Now, who's going to come crawling out of Mariupol? That's I'll easy. bet you'll see. I'll bet you'll see some uh, Allied uh, NATO instructors uh, coming out of there. And I think that's one reason why they're so reluctant to come out uh, without the without getting a female costume so they can sneak out the back door. It's going to be really interesting. She was in there still, uh, and we'll probably learn that this week. And you know, in a broader sense, uh, the reason I don't say I detest Putin, I don't like invasions. I don't like invasions. I don't like people suffering unnecessarily. But to call this war unprovoked is a bald-faced lie, as I tried to outline in what I, what I said before. Yeah. Now, it would be hypocritical for me to say, I would never do what Putin just did. I don't know. If I was the president of a nation that I saw facing an existential ch challenge, and I had a big friend like China backing me up. I dare say, I hope I wouldn't start a war about that, but I would do something very forceful to make clear to NATO, no, no, this is a red line. And I don't know what that other option would be. So I don't wanna be hypocritical. Uh, if I think there's even the remotest chance I would have done what Putin has done. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm gonna, not hate Putin. That's not my province. I'm not going to demonize him. I'm going to say that he was provoked and to say he was not provoked or, you know, is, uh, is really not only propaganda, it's a bold faced lie. And history is replete with instances where he was provoked left and right. And he is convinced that he can't trust 
He can't trust Obama. He can't trust Biden. He can't trust Trump. He can't trust anybody. And when there's a lack of trust, as George Schultz said in his final piece, in the lack of trust, you really are in bad shape if you don't have communications channels. And as far as I understand now, there are no communications channels between the U.S. and Russia that, uh, that need to be in place to prevent the worst from happening. And I hope I'm wrong about that. I suspect I am. But they're sure, certainly few and far between. And if you had generals and, and admirals on the, on the receiving end of what Putin has to say, that's not all to the good either. Do you feel that Putin is showing more restraint than some of his colleagues would show in pursuing? Well, uh, you know, I, I, I'm a, I've had military experience. I was very much wondering, uh, and this is, you know, this is that same uh, projection, you know, this is that same mirror imaging. Everyone thought, even the chief of the general staff, even the joint chiefs of staff said, ah, oh, he'd take Kiev in three or four days, right? Yeah. He could have if he did what we did with Baghdad. I mean, we leveled the place pretty much, or we released it. You know, well, he didn't do that. Why? Because I think he was misguided yeah. in thinking that the Ukrainians might might actually uh, be more inclined to join him if he didn't do it. In any case, he's going to leave there, and uh, he doesn't want to leave for complete chaos behind him. Now, that doesn't dispense him. Uh, from all these uh, all these charges like butcher butcher the butcher of butcher well uh, my friend jerry kosmarov has out a, a, a piece today which goes into who did butcher and jerry doesn't think it was uh, it was the russians who had already left by the time those crimes were committed we're talking about really bloodthirsty nazi type people and they're the ones that are still held up in, in that the Mariupol thing. And so we're going to learn more as, as things go by. But you're supposed to keep an open mind to this. And I guess we have to be charitable when our friends tell us, no, no, Putin is evil. I, I saw it all over CNN and Washington Post and New York Times and all that. And also, it's got to be true. It's really hard. It's really hard to get beneath that. Eh, but we have to keep trying in a charitable way. <laughs> yeah.